Last year I made a video essay that I sort of saw as the ultimate comparison from my viewpoint between McFarlane Toys and Marvel Legends as far as what each company provides, but I focused primarily on just the standard figures that they come up with, especially for their big money makers, Spider-Man and Batman respectively. Never in that video did I ever touch on anything that's a little bit on the extra side, something that's considered either deluxe or mega. And so I thought to myself, that's practically a topic for its own separate video. And that's precisely what we're going to be doing here. We're finally going to take that context out of the equation into its own separate entity and really look at how these companies fare off when they're kind of punching above their weight. As 2023 rolled on, I saw two specific figures for two characters that were just so out there with not only their scope, their proportioning, their, it just the entirety of how they were released that I thought to myself, yes, these are the definitive figures that I want to use as examples for the, co the comparisons between McFarlane Toys and Marvel Legends as far as deluxe mega figures are concerned because both companies try to really do a little bit extra for an increased price but at the same time delivering on something that is very unorthodox for the traditional way that they go for with marvel legends it's traditionally seven inch with the dc multiverse line with marvel legends it's traditionally six inch like they've done for quite literally decades whether it be under hasbro toy biz etc so what is it about these specific figures that really kind of conveys the messaging of where the priorities lie and some of them are a little obvious and then others you'll be surprised by how much credit I actually end up giving to one specific company and here we have the two examples it's going to be the Fulcum Abominus from McFarlane Toys through the DC Multiverse brand for this very obscure character out of one of their comic lines that like I said people probably just don't know about but McFarlane went ahead and mega made a mega figure out of it and then we have Cyborg Spider-Woman from the Across the Spider-Verse wave from last year by Marvel Legends. A figure that just made everybody kind of look twice when it was found up on the shelf and kind of stayed there for certain reasons. These are going to be my two examples because I wanted an excuse to own Fulcum, but at the same time, I was morbidly curious about this Cyborg Spider-Woman, specifically of how she connects to the movie itself, which is definitely going to be a touching point. However, just like I did with that original video essay, there's actually one specific aspect that I do want to touch upon really quickly, and that is actually going to be the box, how both companies kind of present their figures, because this was in fact a topic of debate when it came to these two properties. With McFarlane Toys, it's actually pretty straightforward and obvious. They've been doing the mega figure business for quite some time, and if you have been in the collecting game with McFarlane Toys, whether it be the standard 7-inch DC multi stuff specifically Batman or even some of the mega figure stuff you'll notice that all in all they kept it pretty simple they actually legitimately just took the existing aesthetic of the DC multiverse branding and literally just made it bigger you still got the same exact box only the proportions and the dimensions of the box itself are just a little larger to actually house a much bigger ideally 10 inch figure like this inside of it and the box itself is predominantly black with the white lettering the label of the figure itself and what property it's from on the side on the front you got the dc multiverse logo on the back you got some cool artwork of the character itself yada yada and of course with all the good comes the bad which are of course going to be the twisty ties that you have to cut through pulling them out of the plastic whether it be some of these mega figures containing capes you're going to have to remove those capes thankfully fulcum that wasn't really the case with it but at least with all of those things the only other drawback that i can come up with is that sometimes despite the mega figure as you can see right here being a little on the slimmer side the box is almost always going to retain its shape regardless of which mega figure you have and sometimes that can make storing it in certain areas within box a little bit of a hassle that box kind of moving it about specifically in this light box here for the purposes of the video or if you were to put it away in storage it's going to be a little cumbersome i kind of wish that they would kind of I guess adjust the dimensions of the box and I remember there was a time where they did that for certain cases I think there was a dark side mega figure for the Justice League Zack Snyder 2021 release where they actually either it was dark side or Steppenwolf it was one of those two where they took the mega figure box and actually slimmed it down just a little bit it, like the width and the height were the same but the actual thickness of the box was a little bit more narrow and I appreciated that but since then 
they haven't really done that. They kept the box the same. And so I'm like, all right, extra protection for the guy. But at the same time, <laughs> storing it and moving it around in, you know, really practical locations, kind of a nuisance. But at least this means that it comes with the window in which you can preview the figure and actually look at it, especially when you see him out in the store up on the shelf. And you can tell if, whether or not there's a defect, there's a broken piece, etc. Unlike Cyborg Spider-Woman, who unfortunately came in the windowless, plasticless box. And though I'll give it credit for being a bit smaller on the dimensions, being able to be a bit more compact, much more malleable, you can actually kind of move it around, it takes up less space. Uh, it's a little hefty because of how much of a heavier figure you have contained in the inside. And it's a little bit less of a hassle to get past the packaging inside because they're going plastic free you don't have the twisty ties you don't have the slits should there be any capes or anything like that you just got to remove the cardboard right you kind of disassemble it pull it out of its white bag and you're pretty much set specifically with cyborg spider woman since she technically didn't come with any additional accessories but that's assuming that you're getting Cyborg Spider-Woman. Because <laughs> I know that with the windowless box, this was a huge topic of debate back in 2022, 2023, when Marvel Legends started to do that predominantly with a lot of, a lot of their figures. And they just said, screw it, we're going to do windowless boxes. And so many people were not terribly happy about that because this resulted in a lot of collectors not getting the exact figure that they ordered in the first place. And that was, I think, a major thing with, I think, Amazon. Not so much Hasbro Pulse because you're getting it directly from the source, but whenever you bought it from mainly Amazon and maybe ever so often on Entertainment Earth, there would be some figure swaps. And specifically when you got it in retail like Target and Walmart, there would be some major detriments to the windowless box. And that's that you end up getting the uh, completely different figure because some jackass decided to swap it out. And I think that did happen a couple of times with Cyborg Spider-Woman. She was not abstained from that situation. So that was a bummer, and that's definitely a drawback with that style of box. Despite the compactness of it all, the nice little artwork of Cyborg Spider-Woman on the side, as well as the cool aesthetic of Across the Spider-Verse all over the box with the logo, with uh, Miles, Gwen, and even Miguel on the side. Kind of, It's funny, because as I was unboxing her, made me kind of want to watch the movie already. The only little drawback, though, is that the box still has the letters Part 1 on there. And I want you guys to hold on to that thought of the box itself reading Part 1, because that's actually very important to the, the sheer existence as to why this character even came to be in the first place. But before we do get to her e sheer existence, I do want to cover Fulcum for a little bit, because prior to McFarlane, it kind of releasing this figure, I didn't even know that this character existed. And once it got released, and they said, oh yeah, we're making a mega figure, it's going to be 10 inches, 22 points of articulation. And I looked at this and said, this is so f***ing ridiculous, I have to have it. I needed an excuse to get Fulcum. And beyond the concept of this video... Finally, I got around to getting him at a sale. It was only a $10 discount, but at the same time, the concept of a Voltron-looking Justice League figure where it's predominantly got bat aesthetics, specifically with the ears and the spikes in the back to kind of resemble that of a cape, but you can definitely see that you have so much influence from the remainder members of the Justice League, whether it be Superman there in the middle, you obviously got the lightning bolt there with the flash, as well as the red, the yellow, green, with for Green Lantern, an awful lot of the metal and the gray to kind of bring it all home together here. And it's outside of the comics, his included its inclusion in the comics, this character just in and of itself, like I said, it's just so out there, so outlandish, so crazy that I thought to myself, if McFarlane can really nail down a figure like this in the mega figure format, I'm down for picking him up. And so far, I would say that what McFarlane does with Mega Figures is still at their core strengths with Fulcum Abominus here. Because that's one of the things that McFarlane is able to nail in this scope. Is that the bigger they get with their figures, they know how to handle brush metal, that brush metal kind of look. Even if it is just at the end of the day a paint app, they are still able to nail that style of detail right. And I feel like there's no other better except, well, honestly, Justice Buster is probably the only other way to really convey and illustrate how well they do with brush metal and that metallic look. But second in place, I would say it's going to be Fulcum here because you see an awful lot of that working with the shoulders, the head, the little rivets and the gears working with the metallic parts here around the collar area and then most especially the left arm that is designed to look like this cannon with claws at the end
hand, as well as the hydraulic pumps happening around the elbow area. That's really where McFarlane knows how to hone in on their strengths. Sure, it gets a little quote unquote muddy when it comes to these brighter colors. You definitely have that paint feel when it comes to the yellow and even a little bit of the green. It's got like this Play Doh ish kind of feel. But at the same time, they're supposed to resemble like these armor pieces that are supposed to be covering the much more metallic parts underneath. And it almost feels like I'm holding on to a maquette. It's, I think, in my opinion, just a little shy of 10 inches. So that advertisement gets a little flabby. But at the same time, you're still dealing with an awful lot of shell presence inside of the detail. And with McFarlane already demonstrating how well he does with the Dark Knight's metal line, you can definitely see that this is something that he's, he's going to gravitate towards. So you see an awful lot of points that they're not going to really mishandle, specifically the red. I kind of wish he had a little bit more red other than just this leg part, but at least it's got the Flash logo on it. It's got, like I said, that worn brush metal kind of feel specifically around the joints, the legs. To me, however, my favorite part, it's going to be this backside right here. Pause. But it's got to be the spine area right here only because, like I said, that detail with the brush metal, the individual sculpting of the little rivets to kind of make it look like it's a, a very flexible spine that actually moves about. It's just this part right here that's just so satisfactory to see, including the little wingtips that are actually required to be assembled. This is probably the, I guess you can categorically say, the only other accessories he comes with, which are going to be these spikes that are individually uh, packaged inside of the box. So they do need to be assembled inside of their sockets. Though do be careful because I'll admit the assembly was a little scary, mainly the small ones here. There was actually one that started to bend a little bit when I was trying to press the socket in there. So definitely warm up the sockets as well as the, the pegs themselves so that they can fit a little bit more comfortably and without any kind of struggle or risk of breaking off these little wingtips right here. But once you do that, you can kind of move them about and actually pose them. There's a specific pose that's actually in the promo picks that these are supposed to be much more horizontal but honestly I like the much more angular look to make it look like it's a cape or make it look like it's flying and overall this area right here is really what does it for me that this guy feels less like a toy and more like a maquette that you often see on the side when like visual effects artists are talking about how they made a movie and they have that concept maquette in the background <laughs> when they're doing their like little interview thing this guy feels like something that would be in that interview. But unlike a maquette that's more so like a little statue that doesn't necessarily pose or move about, this guy is in fact, just like other mega figures, articulated really well beyond its belief, beyond what you really think. Because the head itself is on a peg that is able to rotate 360, though you do kind of have to incline it a little bit at an angle to get it to rotate the full 360, but you are able to tilt it up and down. The arms are able to move horizontally to the sides like so, very fluidly, almost at a full T-pose. But moving them up and down, even though the joint itself is there, you're obviously going to have this shoulder piece that's mainly there for accuracy, but it is going to restrict that mobility. Nevertheless, though, those pieces are made out of a flexible rubber that do kind of move out of the way so that they don't, they don't come at the risk of breaking. But at the same time, they're also on their own peg to be able to slightly move up and down so you can kind of have them flush on the shoulder or kind of moving out towards the outside area like so to make them look like they're flexible and posable so in case you ever want to flush them up against the arm a little bit of a bicep swivel on each arm as well as elbow joints though the elbow joints are only bendable at a 90 degree angle and since both hands are technically like these claw cannons that admittedly one of them came a little warped inside the box again a bit of a victim due to the way that these mega figures are often packaged with the plastic and the twisty ties and all that stuff that I was nitpicking about a little earlier you do have a little bit of warpness happening whenever you're dealing with a character that has an awful lot of like spikes and pointy bits and things like that, such as Fulcum here. So you're going to be dealing with that a lot. And I feel like the yellow claw here on the right side is probably the one that fell victim to that the most. But nevertheless, the arms are fully posable. The legs are fully posable. They can move forwards and backwards to the sides and even swivel up on the upper thigh. Two joints at the knees that are fully able to bend, as well as a ball joint at the ankle that is fully able to rotate the foot 360, as well as bend downwards and upwards. Unfortunately, no toe articulation, but these little like bus saw pieces here on the flash leg can actually move up and down and almost rotate a full 360 forwards uh, up until they get kind of restricted here towards the back. So you do have 
that additional little detail there. So that's a nice little trick. The only downside, the only point of articulation that gets hamstrung in a very negative way is the torso because he technically has a mid-torso cut there. But for some reason, it only moves slightly towards the left. And that's really about it. I try to get it to move to the right, but I feel like it's going to break somehow. So a little restrictive and it kind of nudges up and down for a little bit of flexibility but it's not the greatest so articulation could have been a little better on the torso but the argument that you could make although i i'm even a little tired of hearing this argument is that he's a robot he's supposed to have stilted articulation yeah but this is mcfarland this is kind of their wheelhouse kind of wish it was a little bit better and then like i mentioned before you can kind of argue that these spikes are articulated because you can kind of move them about but unlike like i said traditional statues you do have a great amount of articulation with this guy, specifically around the leg area, to make him look even more badass. And so that's something that McFarlane is able to really nail with a good chunk of their mega figures, whether they're movie tie-ins or obscure characters from the comics such as this. And that's the thing with McFarlane is that often he makes stuff because it looks cool. That's often the thing that he says in interviews. I want it to look cool. You know, if it looks cool, we'll, we'll make a figure out of it. If we can squeeze it into the pipeline, if we don't have any tie-ins with DC or any contracts where we need to make the specific figure by this time, that's what they do. And even if we can come up with criticism such as like i said the limited articulation of the torso he doesn't really come with any other accessories just looking at the shelf presence of this guy i'm happy that i got him and he often goes for characters that look cool whether there's some kind of obligation contractual obligation or not this guy wouldn't have known that he existed if it wasn't for this figure and it's a nice little gateway into learning more about the character learning more about the figure and it's something that just doesn't apply to Fulcum here an awful lot of characters that he made into mega figures I look at it and go what the hell is that from and then I get invested into the comic storyline and I'm like all right I actually kind of want to read up on that whereas with Cyborg Spider-Woman you're dealing with an actual contractual obligation which is of course going to be a movie tie-in in the vein of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And by technical default, that means that her release was nothing more than just a corporate decision, uh, obviously, because Marvel Legends has stakeholders, or shareholders rather, that, you know, kind of have a contract out there saying, hey, these are the characters that you guys said that you were going to be able to provide, here you go. And there was a little bit of a kerfuffle with this character because for a little while, people were thinking that she wasn't going to be an individual release. In fact, a lot of people have a theory that she was meant to be a builder figure that was then going to be assembled by you collecting the entirety of the Across the Spider-Verse waves, especially since outside of her, you're literally dealing with just four other characters, Gwen, Miles, Punk, and 2099 Miguel. And generally, it's four figures that come in a builder figure wave, and they all have pieces that then assemble a fifth character. Often, you don't really get a fifth character or a fifth figure in a builder figure. Sometimes they make exceptions, but it's not tradition. So imagine how much of a loop she kind of took the community when she was released by herself. Imagine how much more confusion she generated when, spoilers, we went and saw the movie. She was barely in it. She, she was quite literally in the background during the scene where all the spider people are chasing uh, Miles after Miguel puts uh, more or less a hit on him when uh, he decides to not kind of go with the plan with things. So yeah, it was a little strange to see a release for Cyborg Spider-Woman that was not in the traditional sizing of a 6-inch Marvel Legends figure. She kind of ranges somewhere around the 8, 8.5 inch range for again to scale the mega figures here from dc multiverse are traditionally 10 inches so she kind of falls a little shy of that we're got about i want to say 8 8.5 or so on cyborg spider woman here as far as actual proportioning and shelf presence you can see right here that she is definitely girthy and she's meant to be this apocalyptic take on a spider person that just happens to be inside of uh kind of a cyborg body so you got a little bit of mechanical parts along with of course the very apocalyptic punk aesthetic with the spikes the chains the gas mask look to the mask and etc and of course all these like boots and very rustic bondage kind of look to the to the straps and things like that so the overall aesthetic that they were able to translate here in marvel legends figure form is still commendable and to me it's those details that kind of harken to her background 
Omicron being in the apocalypse and things like that that I think stand out to me the most. Specifically, the shoulder guard here with the spikes, although some, like I said, came a little warped. So she's not completely abstained despite her slightly more uh, convenient packaging with the plasticness, pa plasticlessness of the packaging despite not having a window, at least the warpness wasn't as bad, but it's still present specifically on these spikes on one of her knees, the ones here on the left leg, as well as, like I said, the shoulder guard. But it's, again, those little details, specifically with the chains around the chest, the that shoulder guard, and then, of course, the big Barrett-looking turret gun that she's got on her arm. I'm playing uh, Rebirth. I'm actually on the cusp of beating Rebirth right now, so it's reminding me an awful lot of Barrett from Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. But you can see right here that this is ultimately the the big drawing point as to why someone will get this figure. It's got to be this turret gun, which in my opinion is well detailed, well painted, sculpted, but predominantly sculpted because the actual detail that they went ahead and included with the little rivets and the pistons and the tanks, as well as the ability to be able to rotate the gun in place with this little uh, joint right here, this little swivel that is able to rotate on the upper part of the arm, as well as the turret itself with the spikes right here is able to rotate in place is a nice little touch, especially since if you look a little closer, you could see additional wiring detail inside of the arm right above the upper bicep swivel, you could argue, right here, this point right there. So that's pretty cool. However, it's this arm that also acts as a little bit of a double-edged sword because once you move past this, you start to feel the restrictiveness of the articulation because even though you got this swivel and you even got a vertical swivel here on the upper arm that is able to allow the arm to fully rotate 360, that's really about it. You could try extending it, but it literally just nudges slightly towards the sides above that point right there. That's really about it. It kind of stops right about right there. And again, you could kind of hearken this to a lore explanation that that's how far the arm is able to move if it was real. But sadly, that articulation still feels in place with the rest of the body. And this is where we start to kind of dip a little bit in quality because it's once we get to these thigh areas, the shoulders, the arms, that it feels a little too Marvel legends -y to where it's like, yeah... I wouldn't rule out the possibility that this was, in fact, a Build-A-Figure and they nixed the idea very last second. Especially when they didn't want to take a chance on a character that, I think, as time went on, ended up getting de kind of deleted or rather uh, shrunken down inside of the movie itself. My theory, as well as plenty of other people's theories, is that when this concept for an action figure was pitched to Hasbro Marvel Legends, initially they were still in the concept of making the movie. And when they were making Sen movie, she probably had a much bigger part. So they thought, oh, we'll make a build a figure because, you know, she's going to be this big character that people are going to resonate with. And they're going to be incentivized to collect Miles Gwen, uh, maybe the Peter and the Jessica Drew and, and the Spot on the side. But the main four are the main four that I ended up picking up, which are Miles, Gwen, Miguel, and Spunk. And we're going to throw in those pieces of Cyborg Spider-Woman along with them. And that's what's going to give people a a purpose as to why they want to collect her because they're going to want her after watching the movie. And somewhere down the line, not only along with the name change of the movie, which is why it's no longer called Part 1, but also in the editing process, they probably cut her role down to where she only appears in the background during that chase scene. And I feel like somewhere down the line, they're like, oh shit, what do we do now? Well... Take the pieces, assemble them, and make her a deluxe figure or a mega figure in Marvel Legends' eyes. And I would say that that would not be a good, a bad way to, you know, kind of cut your losses and release her separately so that that way people don't feel obligated to pay even extra for the Marvel Legends. And believe it or not, it's their decision to release her as a deluxe figure that. I still have to give some credit and appreciation for it because they could have easily just scrapped her. Because <laughs> after seeing the movie, I'm still kind of scratching my head as to why they made a figure out of her in the first place. Again, purely speculation, purely theory, but 
my guess, along with other people's, is that she was meant to be a builder figure because she had a greater role in the movie. It got cut down in the process because, keep in mind, that movie, I think, got delayed a couple of instances. And don't even get me started on Beyond the Spider-Verse, which is now delayed indefinitely. So it, was, it was supposed to come out literally just a little while ago, and that got pushed. So don't be surprised if we end up with even more figures that were supposed to come out and then when we go and see the movie, they're barely in the movie. And Cyborg Spider-Woman is a quintessential example of that. And I still appreciate that Marvel Legends went ahead and released her. It's just not enough to kind of distract from that theory because it's, again, once you get to the leg areas, the torso, and then the articulation itself, that the quality, though I can't bring myself to say it's cheap or lackluster or anything like that, it doesn't necessarily scream deluxe either. It still kind of feels like your traditional Marvel Legends. I never think mega, I never feel deluxe, I never feel extra with it. You know, you still are dealing with very basic articulation around the head that is able to rotate. We already kind of covered the turret arm, but the standard arm can slightly move forwards and backwards, but of course it's slightly restricted by the shoulder guard. You do have a bicep swivel that is a little squeaky, two joints at the elbow, as well as two joints on either knee. However, all three of these things are really stagnant, even after passing them with a hot uh, hair dryer, so they're kind of a little bit on the restricted side. The wrist is able to rotate, and there's technically a hinge inside, but because of the way that the spiky cuff here on her wrist is kind of encompassing the entire thing, it's very difficult to get it to move inside and outwards. And then the legs themselves are actually probably the most favorable, part, favorable parts of the articulation, where they're able to move forward that far. Not much towards the back because of the butt sculpt, but they are able to extend to the sides very favorably. Thigh swivels on the top part right here that are fully rotatable, 360. And then the ankles are able to bend downwards very much, but not too much towards the top. And slightly pivot inwards and outwards, but can't really rotate. You're going to have to rely on the thigh swivels for that. Traditional Marvel Legends joints, even on their deluxe figures. And here's the thing is that Marvel Legends has been doing... A pretty bang up job with their deluxe figures as of late, specifically around the No Way Home line, because those are the ones where they had to pack in a little bit of extra value considering the characters that they were tackling, like Doc Ock and Green Lantern. <laughs> like Doc Ock and Green Goblin, for example. But when it comes to a very obscure character like Cyborg Spider Woman, well, not much can really be said as far as value because you're dealing with a character that not a whole lot of people really resonated with coming out of the movie. She doesn't come with any additional accessories beyond this point. And even though, like I said, she's not necessarily all too cheap feeling or, you know, very lackluster. Can I really honestly look at this character and look at this figure here and think to myself, yeah, that's definitely 60 bucks right there. Yeah. That's where we get into a very, very uh, tumultuous area of discussion because Cyborg Spider-Woman retailed for $58.99 or if you want to just go ahead and round it up, $60. Bucks. Marvel Legends decided to release her for $60 bucks, and that's where we then come full circle into whether or not this is a choice of uh, ethics because... Even though she, it's still commendable that they took a chance on releasing her considering her inclusion in the movie. I don't know if, if it's really something to keep pursuing for future movies like Beyond the Spider-Verse. If you're going to be releasing deluxe figures for 60 bucks, Because feeling her in hand, this does not scream 60 bucks. It's not a bad figure, but really? For 60 bucks? Whereas Fulcum over here, guess what? Mega figures from McFarland Toys has have pretty much remained at the exact same price point of $39.99. 40 bucks. So here we got 40. Here we got 60. Which one are you gonna go for? Yeah, both of them lack a little bit of articulation and accessories, but when it comes to sizing, proportion, value, taking a chance on obscure characters despite like i said the cut down role here and still going along for the release of the character it still doesn't take any kind of water outside of the theory out of the theory of her potentially having been a builder figure and they kind of 
nixed that idea and put put assembled all the pieces together to then release her separately. And that's okay. But for 60 bucks? Come on, man. It's so many people felt gypped and thankfully I was able to bypass that because I technically got her at a clearance. But I still need to put myself in the position of people who did in fact buy her day one. And so, if you were to pay full price for either of these figures, I would definitely feel much more comfortable with the Fulcum Abominus, a character that I didn't even know I needed. And once McFarlane made their figure out of this character, I'm toying around with it, I'm putting him in a variety of poses, I'm messing around with the spikes on the back, I'm looking at the detail, he's very fun to shoot for B-roll, it's pretty much a very done deal, a very a very easy given as to which character probably provides the biggest bang for your buck as far as characters that go into the deluxe mega figure area. And I know it's pretty much a very easy argument to have. It's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, this guy's 40 bucks and this guy's 60 bucks, but that's because McFarlane owns his own company and sure, he has deals with DC, but he just makes the concept, pitches it to DC. If they don't like it, he's like, all right, fine, we won't make it. There's no, you know, little... <sighs> There's less people to answer to with McFarlane than there is with Marvel Legends. There's so many stakeholders, including the Big Mouse them himself, that Marvel Legends needs to answer for. And then you also are dealing with Sony in certain areas. I believe you're still dealing with Disney when it comes to the figures. And it's not necessarily a Sony thing. But still, I know that there's so much string still attached to a character and to an output like Cyborg Spider-Woman for the Across the Spider-Verse wave. But eventually the buck needs to stop when it comes to the price point because inflation is becoming a little bit of a bitch for everyone involved. This hobby is getting more expensive by the day. And so when you have McFarlane doing stuff like this, it, the answer is pretty much written b before you can even answer it yourself. Now, that still doesn't really kind of take away from the argument to have for either of these companies going forward in the future specifically with 2024 because the theory that we keep toying around with is should have cyborg spider woman remained a build a figure could this have made maybe the the, the gamification of collecting the build a figure wave for gwen and miles because think about it i was originally going to get gwen miles miguel and spider punk already prior to even knowing about Sp cyborg spider woman whether it be with the deluxe figure here or b simply by just seeing the movie imagine if maybe they remain retained the idea of having her be a build a figure boom there's a bonus figure that i didn't know i wanted i got access to her as opposed to going out of my way of buying her separately so do you think that maybe Marvel Legends should stay the route of build a figures or do you, should they do much more deluxe releases like this? Because on the one hand, obviously they're still doing build a figures to this day with some other obscure characters, characters that don't necessarily have to do with Spider-Man. And recently they've been doing an awful lot of X-Men and Fantastic Four stuff, specifically with X-Men 97. But at the same time, they've also been doing not too shabby with deluxes like Doc Ock and Green Goblin like I mentioned before even though they still came with their little drawbacks and caveats. As with McFarlane I'm a little nervous that we haven't really gotten too many mega figures recently whether it be official releases or simply just future announcements. I know recently we did get the announcement of that Doomsday that has like the green kryptonite all over it and it kind of looks like a predator <laughs> but it is technically a mega figure it's retailing for the standard 40 bucks so we did get one announcement and build a figures are still happening although one of them as I touched upon in the last video is going to be a digital only build a figure that is kind of playing into the whole digital collectible slightly NFT market and I'm a little nervous that little by little he's starting to cut back on the mega figures we had so many releases in the prior years specifically with like I said Zack Snyder's Justice League in 2021 Justice Buster Titan Joker etc you know there were chances being taken but going into 2024 and we're already almost a third of the year done and we've only gotten one mega figure re release or reveal that's up for pre-order and then another one is going to be digital only with the build a figure wave. I'm like, okay, you know, things are looking uh, a little concerning when it comes to getting more bangers like Fulcum here. But let's pretend that McFarlane is still interested in creating mega figures and they simply just haven't announced them. What do you guys think about the idea of McFarlane getting into the BAMF business? The build a mega figure business. As in something like this, but it's 
separated amongst their standard DC Multiverse 7 inch fare, but you get to build a mega figure with it. What do you guys think? Would you guys be willing to pay the extra price? Say each figure is 30, maybe even 35 bucks, but you get a piece to build a mega figure, not just a standard seven inch figure, but a mega figure. So you have this big towering thing at the end of collecting all four. What do you guys think about that concept? I'm actually pretty curious to see what the discussion is around that. What do you think about mega figures being created by some toy companies such as Marvel Legends, uh, McFarlane, hell, even some other brands like Spin Master, Jack Specific, uh, Jada Toys, etc. I don't know. It's becoming a very interesting climate for the collectible market, especially with, like I said, inflation and things like that. Or do you think that we're starting to see the sunset years of this concept and we're going to be strictly just dealing with 6 inch stuff, 7 inch stuff, statuettes, digital collectibles, Lord have mercy. I don't know. Whatever your guys' insights are, let me know down below. And as always, if you guys enjoyed the comparison, let me know by hitting the thumbs up button. If you guys got triggered, let me know by hitting the thumbs down. And as always, guys, stay humble, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.